Dr. Rohr, are you with us? I am, Excellent. and thanks for having me. Thanks so much for, for coming on. So um, I, I noticed that you wrote an article on this, and I just wanted to talk to you about uh, what your thoughts were on Martin Screlly buying the intellectual property of this particular pill and then um, you know raising the price from 1350 to 750. Well, actually, there's quite a bit of similar things going on. Older drugs that, um, you know, maybe are only made by one company now because they have a very small population of patients who need them um, are susceptible to this type of thing. Uh, for example, if a, if a company buys uh, the rights to exclusive distribution from a company that's making such a drug, of course, they can jack the price up pretty much as high as they want. And in some cases, if the drug wasn't approved after 1962, they can actually go back and do the FDA studies that were required after 1962 under the Orphan Drug Act. Okay. And if they get an approval, then the FDA will actually grant them a monopoly for several years. So there's a lot of generic, old generic drugs for small patient populations that are now getting very highly priced. And there are some that, you know, really are having this kind of a markup. So, you know, when uh, Turing's CEO said that this wasn't unusual. He was unfortunately correct. This has been happening a lot. So this is the promised uh, innovation in the area of drugs uh, distribution and drug uh, manufacture that we were promised with intellectual property, um, right? Well, you know, <laughs> I don't think actually his his drug is covered under patents anymore. It's an old drug. It came out in the 50s. Okay. So um, what, and, and I don't know that he's taken it through this process that I just described. I haven't been able to find evidence of that. The Orphan some, Drug Act. Yeah, but some people think he may have done that, and I haven't been able to dig that information out yet. But even if he hadn't, he would still be in a great position because if somebody wants to compete with them, which they probably would if they saw that price, yeah, they still have to jump through FDA hoops. They still have for their even generic. As a generic? Drug. Yes, even as a generic, you have to show that it's equivalent to what's already on the market. Oh. Now, that's not impossible. It's done all the time with generics, but the problem is it is costly and it takes a few years. And so, by isn't it also limited by the fact that there's so few people that actually have this condition well, to test see, on? That's, yes, that's the problem. So, even if you went and did those studies and showed the FDA that, yes, your product is equivalent, you might not be able to make up your costs because. It's such a small number of people, especially since the original person, for example, Turing, could undercut you as soon as you got to market just to drive you out of business. Sure. You know, and you might if and and you might not be able to capture any of the market share because you're not first to market. Being first to market is very important in the pharmaceutical industry. And this is not the first time that the price has gone up somewhat drastically for this particular drug. This That's drug, right. Doraprim, was bought by another pharmaceutical company a few years ago, and the price went from $1 to $13.50. It's a big... That's right. That's right. And this is happening to a lot of generics. You know, this is happening quite a bit to drugs that aren't used that much, but are very important to the patient population, you know, that they do serve. And I'm seeing here in the article that you wrote, and we've posted it on the Facebook page for anybody that wants to find the article, you say that when that happened, when it went from $1 to 1350 per pill, the number of prescriptions dropped about 30%. Mm -hmm. What was being used instead of this to treat toxoplasmosis? Well, my understanding is that this drug is used in conjunction with some other ones. And my suspicion, I don't know this for sure because I haven't talked to the doctors who dropped their patients off this or didn't use it anymore, but they may simply have used the other few drugs. And there may be some more out there that actually work that doctors are aware of. So, you know, they may, or they may have just gone without. In some cases, that's probably what happened. So um, at this point, this isn't an issue of him being protected by intellectual property. This is an issue of competitors being kept out of the marketplace by 
uh, by the FDA's uh, rules as far as getting a drug in, in play. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Even, like I said, even if he went through this process that some people think he might have and did studies on it so that he would, you know, get in under the Orphan Drug Act and get this um, special monopoly period, obviously it's not a patent monopoly, it's a regulatory monopoly. So that's, you know, either way, I don't think it's an intellectual property type of uh, problem. So, and I've got a question. In one of the interviews that I watched with him, he, he talked about how his company would not be turning anyone away, and and generally, well, uh, he's been giving this away to yeah, people. Gives it away for free. Well, how, what I wonder is how true is that? You know, like if these, if he's this just is going about, after insurance companies, isn't he? I would expect that that would be true, but at seven hundred fifty dollars, I mean, I don't even know if uh, you know with copays and whatnot, how much of this is covered. No, nope. couldn't say. No, it's, well, you know, the, I think a course of this um, therapy is somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple months to maybe a few more months. So, and I believe it's a daily dose. So, you know, you can kind of get a feel for how much it would cost. And the numbers, yeah, the numbers we're talking about in terms of prescriptions, I don't think that includes hospital use. So, you know, hospitals, of course, probably get it at a much cheaper price. There's a, and you know, Medicare and Medicaid, they, I'm sorry, Medicaid at least, I don't know about Medicare. Medicaid gets it at a much cheaper price too. So it's hard to say how much you know actually is being sold at seven fifty? Yeah, it's uh, in many ways this is. Um, it, it seems like they're just sort of vilifying this guy in order to. Uh, um, I mean, because what they're making it seem like is is that he's charging the poorest of the poor people seven hundred and fifty dollars for a pill, which doesn't seem to be entirely true. It seems like it's the insurance companies who. And the insurance companies get their premiums from us, so essentially it's distributing the cost amongst everybody inside of, that has an insurance policy, which at this point is supposed to be everybody. So to some so, extent, this is almost a tax. Yes. I mean, in a way, when you think about it, this drug has been selling for very little for a long time. And a few years ago, then, as you mentioned, it went up to 1350 It was still, you know, because of the short term of treatment and because it usually helps produce a cure, you know that was still within the realm. Uh, I think the 750 is is getting a little on the high side. Sounds like it's high to me, Doctor Brewer. I'd hold the line yeah. if you would. Uh, uh, <laughs> what we've been talking about here is is in fact the uh, Martin the, Shkreli. Yeah, the Martin Shkreli situation where this uh, hedge fund guy buys up uh, this drug uh, called Duraprim and then um, hikes the price from $13 to $750. And rather than just having us talk about it, we brought on the, the, the preeminent uh, voice in the Liberty community who also happens to have been a uh, drug researcher in the past. It's Dr. Ruart, who, by the way, just released her uh, fourth edi edition of Healing Our World, and um, I'm, I'm really excited about it. So, Dr. Ruart, you, you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Excellent. So we were talking about, uh, you know, pricing and this sort of thing. So you don't think the seven hundred and fifty dollars per pill on this uh, this drug is um, is particularly crazy as far as the, the marketplace goes? Well, the marketplace, remember, has been warped by the cost of FDA regulations. Yeah. I mean, if you were putting out a brand new drug, it would cost you over a billion dollars out of pocket. If you wanted to count all the 12 some years that it took you to get there, you know, and capitalized it, it would be twice that. So it's just outrageous. And then and then what happened? So so this particular uh, company isn't doing anything that isn't permitted by law. But what's what's permitted is made possible by these regulations. So yeah. this is not about, as I say in the title to my blog, it's not, it's not, is it corporate greed or excessive regulation or both? And quite honestly, it's both. Yeah. As a matter of fact, people can go over to ruart.com and see that. Uh, that's R-U-W-A-R-T, ruart.com. Do you have a, a solution to this? How would you, how would you go about uh, solving it? I've seen your speeches on, um, you know, the problems the FDA brings into the area of uh, drug uh, creation. Yes, we need to move from a system of drug approvals and and regulation in that manner to a certification process. You know, the FDA doesn't test any drugs. Most people think they do. 
all they do is they tell the pharmaceutical firms what tests to run, and then they look over their data. There's no third party involved. But we used to have third party testing. Right. A lot of people think that, right? The FDA walks with a bunch of guys walking around in white coats. They're uh, testing drugs to make sure that everything's fine. They're a big drug testing organization. They don't do any of that. And there's a no. lot of people that think that the FDA goes into all of the food plants and does test because without the FDA, Mark, you would eat tainted bacon. <laughs> well, and, and it's it's kind of gotten worse since 1992 because the Prescription Drug User Fee Act has got the drug companies paying a user fee, at least that's what they're calling it, uh, to have their uh, data reviewed. And right now, the part of the FDA that reviews this data gets about 50% of their money from the pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, if you think about the conflict of interest involved there, it's huge. And and before that, uh, the FDA mostly got its money from Congress. Now, you might say, well, that's, you know, it's, it's our money coming from Congress. And of course it is in reality, but that's not how the FDA looked at it. It wanted to please Congress and Congress beat up on it every time there was any side effect. And every drug has a side effect. So the FDA was in a really impossible situation. So what they did is they dragged out the whole testing and approval process. So it went from like four and a half years in the early 1960s to about 14 years in the 2000s. And now I think it's back down to 12. So, I mean, it's, right. it's, it's terrible. You know, so there are drugs the right now that could solve all kinds of problems that we don't even know about. And they're 12 years from getting to market. Or worse, they never get to market because what happens is the drug company realizes that if it has a brand new drug to cure a disease that nobody's cured before, it has a tough time because it doesn't know what dose it needs, it doesn't know how long to run the studies, how many patients. So if it makes a mistake and has to repeat studies that take years, the patent may be expired by the time it gets to market and it goes generic the first day and they lose a lot of money. So, you know, there's there's a lot of drugs that never make it to market. Um, I was working on one for liver disease and the FDA called me up personally to say, oh, we're going to help you get this drug to market because there's nothing for liver disease. You know, we want you to be able to put this drug on the market. But the reasoning I just described really killed it because the company realized that it would be off patent by the time we got out if we didn't do everything right the first time. The FDA is killing people. Yeah, basically. And, and but either by waiting for drugs, killing innovation. And then the other thing is keeping inexpensive prevention basically a secret. I mean, we knew, for example, folic acid, a B vitamin, would prevent uh, spina bifida and other birth defects way back in the early 80s. But the FDA told the folic acid companies if they advertised this, that, you know, they would um, shut them down because they hadn't jumped through all the regulatory hoops. No, right. they can't they? say that water cures dehydration. That is exactly right. I actually, as an expert witness, testified to that one time. It's <laughs> insane. Um, yes. So what you were saying that there should be a certification process. What should that That's look right. like? Well, you know, what should happen is third parties should test the drugs themselves. You know, obviously, talking to the pharmaceutical firms, if the FDA is still around at that point, no problem talking to them. But basically what certification does is it says, okay, this is our opinion of the drug, you know. And so doctors, you know, this is what it's about. And you make the decision, uh, doctor, and you make the decision patient if you want to use this drug. So it's always up to the people who have to actually experience the side effects of the drug. That which makes is a heck patient. of a lot more sense. Yes. And, you know, cancer patients actually sued the FDA for the right to take drugs that had been tested in humans for safety, but not for effectiveness. And they did it on the grounds that the Constitution guarantees them a right to life and that, uh, you know, they should be able to do this. And the courts ruled that, no, in fact, there was no constitutional right for for you to save your life with unapproved drugs. Yeah, it's, this fascinates me where they can uh, really justify keeping drugs from terminally ill patients. They're going to die. What do you care if they uh, the drug might be dangerous for them? In this circumstance, we're not even talking about it being dangerous, just being ineffective. But even if it was, who cares? Uh, I mean, you know, we're talking about terminally ill people. 
Yes. Well, the arguments that have been used is that if if patients can take such drugs, then no one will want to enroll in the clinical trial and you'll never know if it works or not. But the thing they're missing there is that every drug works. And the reason every drug works is because there's always a placebo effect. <laughs> and you know, I don't think cancer patients care if they're cured by a drug effect or a placebo effect. I imagine they don't. Dr. Ruart, thank you so much for uh, coming on and uh, enlightening us on this uh, topic. It's ruart.com in order to see the article. And uh, where do people go to get Healing Our World's fourth edition? They can go to the same place. Ruart.com, R-U-W-A-R-T.com. Dr. Mary Ruart, thank you so much. Thank you.